here we have Peter Noba Neubauer and he's uh, gonna tell us about how to benchmark in a project that they are started actually LDBC. So thank yes. you for coming. No. Yes. Hi, I'm Peter and, um, and yeah, I wanted to talk about the beginnings of the LDBC. The LDBC is, the, uh, is a U EU project called the Linked Data Benchmarking Council. Um, so, so the mission of LDBC is, uh, is to develop, endorse and publish uh, uh, RDF and, and, and graph benchmarks. There's nothing around that is like kind of comparable between these, these database systems. There's a, there's a couple of different benchmarks, that, but they're done by vendors and so on. And, and following the example of TPC, um, the European Union is very interested in, in getting that, that stuff like worked on. Right. There's a big data initi initiative in the uh, in the uh, seventh framework program, and this is one of the long-standing issues. So after nagging for like I don't know, like three years by Stefano Bettolo, one of the one of the stewards of these programs, uh, finally uh, a number of players got together to to uh, work on this concentrated. Um, so it's basically about a, a number of different aspects of, of, of benchmarking. One is, of course, the data sets. Like, wh where do you get good data sets from? Big data sets, relevant data sets that are uh, relevant for, for industries to look at, uh, and not just <coughs> generated stuff, which tends to be very academic and very edgy and very non-representative for what people are actually encountering in, in, in real life. Um, then, of course, benchmarking methodology. Uh, that's very hairy. Normally, what happens is that whoever puts out the benchmark wins, right? I mean, that's and and it's very very hard to make benchmarks in a way that is even comparable um, because there's so much moving parts. There's hardware involved. There's there's like interpretations of like the height of the stack involved. Like, what are you actually testing? Are you testing like, you know? file I.O. or are you testing a parser performance to get your, your query even down to what, whatever you're testing? And, and th there's so many moving parts. And then, of course, there's the interpretation of what are you actually testing? Are you testing like uh, 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 transactional loads or are you testing whatever loads? So, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be taken care of and really specified in order to even give people a chance. And, and uh, these benchmarks are not just for users or, or for like comparing products. It, it's much more important than that. It's actually for the, for the vendors that are in there or for the projects to have a chance to make performance improvements to their products because benchmarking is something that every you know, project with self-respect has to do and everyone starts from scratch. It's, it's so much work to put out these, these like data generators and, and these, you know, all the variants, all the permutations of stuff you want to do, like a cluster of, like an HA cluster of five, of seven, of eight in three different regions and two different regions and on these pro cloud providers. I mean, the permutations just explode, right? So, so we have a lot of work already just executing these things, much less designing them, right? So this is like collaborative efforts that need to be done. And then, of course, the the dissemination of, of these benchmark results and the methodologies to, of course, use at the wider community, which, which basically I'm doing now, uh, and, and also authors of, of benchmarks. So, so uh, uh, for instance, there's like uh, um, um, organizations concerned around actually auditing benchmarks, so not, no one like cheats and, and puts out stuff that is not, that, that's not adhering to the rules and so on. You, you, you can't just put out like a benchmarking room somewhere where someone goes in. People do that off-site in their own labs and then there need to be some form of control, right? So what's the background? Why, why, why did that happen? Uh, what we have seen in the last few years is an explosion of uh, not only graph data, data but even like RDF data and linked data uh, in, 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 in our connected world. Um, the social, of course, we have the, the, the Facebook graph, which we, which we heard about for two years ago from Zuckerberg. Now we have, you know, graph search, which is basically using this stuff to, to, to do real-time uh, searches. We have Twitter graphs, we have Google knowledge graphs, and we have, like, loads of other stuff. And these are just the visible tips of the iceberg. 
what what is much more interested, interesting is the semantic data that is that is in there, right? Um, we have, uh, as I said, benchmarking is hard. We see it in in, in TPC. Uh, the TPC consortium for relational benchmarking is what 15 years old or so, and it's taken like 10 years to even get somewhere which is remotely like trustworthy for people to 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 look at. Uh, and still, it's very hard to compare, like uh, Oracle and and SQL Server on a TCP benchmark. There's still so much <coughs> that is not really comparable. Um, another another background is the the uh, uh, W3C uh, uh, linked open data initiative that has started for like a number of years ago when people realized that RDF is probably not going to happen in in that form as Tim Berners-Lee wanted it to happen, but we have to go down to more pragmatic ways and we call it linked data and microformats and, and, and other stuff that is kind of not the pure way to do it uh, according to the semantic web, but it's a more pragmatic way, but it's still able to link data sources e to each other. And that, that seems to be like more in the spirit of, of you know, pragmatic uh, uh, businesses out there. So, so we actually have initiatives that that foster this, we have uh, uh, we have lots of big RDF and and linked data sets coming out now and and being usable. We have Wikipedia, DBpedia, uh, for instance. We have you know World Factbook. We have uh, DBpedia. We have even open gov open government data. Actually, uh, Europe is very good in 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 like fostering this. We have the Open Government Initiative. We have even other like very dense data that is putting, uh, being put online. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the uh, Inspire initiative, which is, which is even like fostering the, the uh, opening of not only you know, government data and other open data sources, but even open spatial data, which, which means you put out data sets on you know, um, dust bins or or streets or governmental like municipality borders or like the whole open street map thing is basically open data right so so there's big data sets that that people want to crunch and that means we need data systems to be able to do that okay so what is the project um the project uh, consists right now of a number of participants uh, this is fourth, uh, the uh, Crete Institute for, com uh, uh, for Computer Science uh, on Crete uh, in Heraklion. Um, there's Neo Technology, where I'm working, uh, involved. Uh, it's basically players from two fractions or from, from two sets of technologies. One is the semantic te technologies, RDF databases and triple stores. And then there's a few players uh, from, from the graph database side where, where the model that's implemented and, and the underlying technology uh, is a bit different from storing triples. Um, so, so there's like different implementations. And that's one, one of the benchmarking things too. There's like very different implementations on, on the same model that, 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 that comes out. Um, there's Ontotext. Um, there's uh, OpenLink Software Virtuoso, you might have heard, is a, is a quite well-known like triple store. Uh, very, very good technicians in there. Um, then we have Dama, uh, the producers, like it's, it's the, uh, it's the uh, University in Barcelona. Uh, they're producing a, a, a project that's called DEX, uh, which they're interested in, in benchmarking. Uh, there's the TU Munich, uh, which has a very strong uh, interest in, in benchmarking of databases in itself. They have been involved in the TPC um, a project, so from there it's a very good overlap to, to, to have them in there. Uh, and that's the University of Innsbruck, uh, also very strong background in, in benchmarking. Uh, and then there's the uh, University of Amsterdam, not far from here, uh, that's involved too, uh, with, a, with a very strong background in actually commercial databases and benchmark and data generators. I will say more about uh, one of the data, data generator approaches uh, we're, we're trying to do there uh, later. So what's the funding? Uh, basically, it's the EU uh, FP7 uh, program. Uh, we from Neo Technology have been very, very hesitant to join this project. Normally, EU project is not our style of driving business. 
uh, especially for like a smaller company, it's these things tend to be very, very intense. However, um, I'm very positively uh, surprised that the administration overhead, at least in this project, has been manageable. So, 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 uh, so hats off for that. Uh, it's uh, it's about three years. It will run for three years, uh, and the funding is about three million euros. So there's actually a number of people able to dedicate time to to that project, and we're trying to keep the the administrational and report overhead uh, at a minimum. So we actually get stuff done, which always is the problem in in, in EU project, right? Um, uh, and it was started not long ago in October, first uh, of October. So. So I can't give you like a lot of a lot of results yet. I'm just like this is just the first you know talk on what's going to happen and what 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 we're trying to do. Um, okay, the deliverables. What what is going to happen? Uh, so the the project is is um, done in seven I think work packages, um, which have their deliverables. The work package uh, one uh, is about like benchmark uh, design, and what is worked on right now is an overview of existing benchmarks that's that's out there. So we don't, you know, do stuff from the beginning again. Um, and there's, for instance, the Graph 500 benchmarks. There's there's like uh, RDF data sets and and so. Then there's benchmark principles and methods. Uh, as I said, like it's very, it's very hairy to define what actually the benchmark comprises. What what you need. To, to actually take into uh, consideration. And then, of course, like wh wh how am I going to you know, query my benchmark? I could, of course, say, oh, I can write everything as assembler and whatever, give me some data set and I will compile it down and then my benchmark begins when, when everything is down there. Or do I start at like, actually a level that is interpreted languages like, like SQL or wh whatever, or Sparkle, like up there, which means I have a big like parser, I have a big like the, the, the thing gets much more hairy, right? Um, but the levels need to be need to be defined. Um, uh, th there's some there's some languages we are considering to 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 have as a as a standard ingester. However, that's not fair either because not everyone's implementing it, especially for graph databases. There is there's no standard right now. Everyone is trying to do it as at the most pragmatic level possible because graph databases come from a pragmatic background. Um, uh, however, this is a more, uh, like Gremlin, as we have heard before, is a more uh, imperative approach on the Java uh, uh, JVM where you say like how you're going to traverse the graph, like a, a bit like XPath, that's where it comes from actually. Um, and, and then we have Sparkle in the, uh, in the RDF world. Uh, which is kind of the de facto standard. Uh, however, it's a very big specification, so so it might be you know a, a matter of discussion um, what of that uh, of, of that that framework to implement, and if you know owl and and reasoning is part of that uh, the whole thing. Um, uh, the work package one. Uh, no, that's work page two, I think. Uh, it's the it's the analysis and classification of choke points, which is a, a, a very interesting, um, I think, for for the projects involved because uh, you actually see okay, possible choke points typical for 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 a graph, for instance, would be super nodes, like nodes that have like one million outgoing or incoming edges. Essentially, you treat a node as a key value store, right? Or you say like 10 billion, why not that? Then you suddenly have like a graph and in there is basically key value store. How do you handle that? That's a typical choke point for anyone trying to process graphs. If you hit a super node, poof, things blow up, right? So, so, so that is, uh, that, that are interesting things. Um, and then uh, data generators are a big um, possible choke point. So, so in, in, in a very simple scenario, uh, what everyone does is, okay, I have like, um, I don't know, businesses and addresses and persons, and okay, let's do a thousand business, a thousand addresses and a thousand persons, and you know, just you know, generate this stuff. However, the problem is in real world things, um, uh, things are more complicated than that since uh, data is correlated. 
So, so there is some work done. Uh, this will probably be an approach uh, along these lines, which I'm, I'm well, trying to do. Um, there's work done by, by Peter Bonds and Ori Erling and, uh, and Minduk Panam uh, on a gen data generator that takes into account correlations between, you know, the data. Uh, and these are non-trivial. Uh, a typical thing is, for instance, that, you know, a person's location is correlated with the person's name. You have, you generate a thousand persons over like 20 cities in Europe. However, if you hit Rome, then Luca and Antonio might be very correlated in the name property of these things. Um, if you just randomly pick a name for every, every node at every location, then the resulting data set will not reflect what's happening in, uh, in real life because Antonio might then get a super node correlated to the node Rome, which, uh, which might describe the, the, the location. And these correlations are everywhere. Like in real life, correlations are not only on these things, but even of the, on the social vicinity of things. Like if I am a friend of this, uh, these four people and I'm of the, of the age of like 25, the probability is much higher that my favorite music band, which might be a property, is what Britney Spears or whatever, instead of, you know, someone who's, who's 75 with his vis social vicinity. So in order to generate these things, you need serious consideration of, of how these data, data sets work. Um, so, so what happens is that we're working on probability functions to, to do this, uh, like the probability of one property being, being uh, correlated with another property. So if you, if you look at uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, for instance, here a typical, you know, correlation. Um, you have here a, a person node, and there's another one if, if, you, if you take a social, like, benchmarking thing. Uh, and, and these people are happening to be, you know, they know each other, which means the correlation of their study, given their, uh, their birth here, uh, is likely to be higher uh, that they study at the same university, which is empirical, like that, that, that's what happens. Uh, and also, their correlation when it comes to likes is, is like likely to be like that. So, so, so there's like a multitude of correlations you want to factor in, uh, at least a couple of them. Uh, what happens in this approach is that, that actually a MapReduce approach is used to to generate one, one property at a time with the correlation <coughs> of, uh, of all the other uh, nodes in a sliding window. So what you do is you go, say you want to you wanna do like 20 million people and their, and their likes properties, like whatever they like, uh, and you have generated the location. And you say there's a correlation between, or let's say age property. There's a, there's a scalar property, the age, and there's another property what music they like, right? Uh, then you have a probability function here that says, you know, the, the, uh, the closer the age is, the higher the probability that they like this and that. Um, and then you take a window of probability, which you think like, okay, everything until down to like, I don't know, correlation of 0.2, we will consider as a correlation. Then we will just not care. Um, and, and this is the, the sliding window of uh, ordered, scholar ordered, uh, for instance, age properties of the, of the nodes that you're looking at. Uh, and then you, you, you slide a window here and apply the, the, the correlation function and fill the next ones here. Uh, the, the nice thing here is that you can actually multipass and parallelize uh, the generation of these correlations over vast data sets, which means you can do it in Hadoop, for instance. If you want to do that, like normally it takes days and weeks to generate these data sets because you need basically random access to, to all the correlations uh, of, of, your, of your total node vicinity. 
and it becomes very hairy to fish out. Oh, I'm generating this right now, so I need to take into account, you know, it, it gets just super slow to just do one node or one, one data point. So this has the nice um, uh, ability to take one correlation, go over the whole data set in parallel in Hadoop, and then take the next correlation and generate the next thing if you do it in the right order. Uh, that way, uh, data sets with, with three and four correlations uh, can be generated in a matter of hours um, uh, that have like real, real life uh, correlations, like 20 million nodes or, or something. Um, so so that's, that's a big area of research to generate good data sets. Um, also because live data sets are not scalable. If you want to see, you know, oh, we have a Twitter data set of say 500 million edges or something. Uh, what happens if we they do 5 billion edges because, oh, we saw something here, let's, let's scale that up, right? Then the generation of that is basically not possible be, because you don't have the algorithm. So data generators are good, but they need to be accurate. Okay. Um, then another approach uh, is, of course, to take other uh, uh, benchmarks and so on and to, to make them into uh, usable data sets. There are things out there, for instance, the social, social network intelligence benchmarks uh, that are used for, for RDF already. There's something out there. So we are right now working on taking uh, the RDF model and densify it into a property graph model, which is what, what for instance, Neo4j uses. Uh, so, so to be usable as a benchmark for, for graphs and take away the, the kind of like owl over layers and, and, and that kind of stuff to make it like more representative of, of what graph databases deal with. Um, so, so this is uh, another approach to, to not generate but like adapt other, other data sets to that. Um, then the, um, the other thing is of course to, to benchmark different types of workloads. Um, uh, there's, there's what we have heard this morning, like a lot of uh, uh, graph operations are actually analytics. They are like OLAP or whatever. You have a graph that is non-transactional. However, that is totally non-relevant in, in a production graph that actually processes transactions. And you need to make sure that these things are flushed to disk, which has a severe import, uh, performance import, uh, in, impact, right? And they're multi-threaded multi, uh, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, the complexity of queries. Um, what do you do, like a, a benchmarking a, you know, clustering coefficient uh, algo is totally different from doing a, like, friends of friends traversal. It's, it's way more expensive, right? So, so what are you actually benchmarking? Graph global queries, graph local queries, uh, depth first, breadth first, uh, uh, taking into consideration uh, a number of measures. Um, Rack package 3 is uh, uh, geared towards graph databases. So the whole project basically go, tries to, to go side by side RDF stores, triple stores, and their benchmarks, and graph databases and their benchmarks. So we try to keep very, very close and very good uh, focus. So this is use case analysis for graph databases. And for that, there's actually a technical user community. So if you have big interesting uh, data sets that you have problems with and that are usable, um, please contact me and contact the ldbc.eu uh, to be part of that group because both the, the, the consortium and the researchers are crying for benchmark, benchmarkable data sets um, that, that, that they can actually write like papers on and, and test stuff on that are that are represented and that are like real, real word data sets, right? Data generators take you only so far. Um, and then, uh, oh, there's nothing there. Uh, and then use cases, not user cases, but use cases. Um, uh, what are the typical, for instance, industries that, that graphs are relevant in? What we see, for instance, in, in NeoFJ is like, the most odd industries that you would never expect, like like uh, uh, product configuration management or or you know classical domains that have been described by Cod in this paper, that now are implementing in, in, in graph databases, um, and then researchers have their uh, 
their stake in this in, in this technical com community. There has been one meeting in, in actually in Barcelona, um, and there will be the next one in Munich uh, in March. And then uh, navigational benchmarking, which is basically to to find out like how good can you navigate through through like deep deep graphs, right? What happens if you do a typical navigational benchmark is routing. What do you do with the OpenStreetMap data set when you have a turn-by-turn -turn navigation through, say, Romania, which might possibly have 5,000 turns or 5,000 like links? That's heavy stuff like A-star algorithms and that, that kind of thing. Um, and the other one is, uh, uh, the other approach is, of course, what, for instance, Cypher tries to do, like pattern matching that you express the patterns you're looking for, and then you give it to the database, and the database will give you back whatever it finds. Sparkle does the same. You, des you describe a pattern, and you give it to the, to, to the database, and it will uh, give you back stuff, instead of imperatively saying, you need to go like that. Um, uh, same thing here. How far down, down the rabbit hole do you go? Do you actually describe your your traversals in like JavaScript that one database system might understand natively, another one is implemented in .NET and has to do like a lot of, you know, forth and back to even, even get to a state where it can give you an answer. All right, it will be, yeah. Uh, work package force, RDF, I will not say anything to that. I, I'm too little knowledgeable about that. Uh, work package five is uh, the LDBC portal. Um, which is basically, you know, where all the stuff is, is collected, so people can actually find things. Uh, work package six is um, the foundation. So, so the, the ambition is that since these things take so long, three years will be spent on you know, just designing this stuff, but actually there needs to be a foundation to steward the whole process going forward because you know, the foundation will enlarge and there will be other vendors. Actually, now hardware vendors are joining the whole thing. So, so like Cray and, and, and Yark and so is, is starting to join the consortium to benchmark hardware, right? And IBM and, and so. Uh, so. So this needs to be done. The IPR plan, um, you know, anything that is developed in, with European tax money, of course, should be open. So there needs to be clear guidelines on when you contribute to LDBC, then anything you contribute is clearly divided into a public part and something that, that might not be public, like prior art and, and, and excluded background and so. Um, and then, of course, a big thing is auditor training. Um, if anyone, everyone does the benchmarking by himself, then we're likely to end up again with like whoever does the benchmark wins. Right. So, so there needs to be guidelines on how to do this and who is going to audit these things. Um, and uh, I think that's basically it. Uh, work package 7 is reports. i rather not do that. <laughs> uh, and that's it. I'm uh, done. Thank you so much. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah, actually, I would have several questions, but I just put two. Uh, let's say from a more community point of view, uh, um, on a more generic uh, side, how is this possible, if it is possible, to contribute to the project? And on a more specific note, as you asked for uh, usable uh, databases for benchmarking, uh, what do you care about when asking for such database? I mean, do you care for size, do you care for expressivity? I mean, what kind of database are you looking for? Uh, your data set? Uh, data sets, yeah. uh, anything, anything. Uh, it is very unclear at this point <laughs> if there is even a common ground to benchmark because uh, uh, graphs as a concept are so vastly differently implemented. I mean, you can basically say anything that's, that's open data is a graph. And if you want to benchmark, like the, the, the most uh, promising thing is to actually take use cases and say, we have a data set, we have a use case that is a real-world problem. How do we fastest solve that problem, starting here and stopping there? So anything that is a data set that is sizable, that poses possible choke points that you experience 
choke points with and would and have some time to get investigated right mm -hmm. i mean this is this is 36 months so so don't expect uh, and it's a eu project so don't expect immediate results uh, but if you can strategically like identify such a data set just contribute it there will be people looking into that and they can identify like back or forth and that might be the structure of the data set dense data or just the vastness of the data it might be like you know 250 billion logs that are very shallow but still it's a very valid thing to to like calculate clustering on that right so how how can we solve that best and that will give very different answers uh, on on what performs well. That's also one of the, the reasons to do this, to actually give recommendations on this kind of problem solving. You might want to use this kind of system. Right now in NoSQL land, for instance, it's Wild West. Whoever thinks he knows the system well does implement his, his problem with that. So, and, and that needs to kind of come to a more nuanced uh, way. So, so yeah, whatever you have, we're thankful for, for anything. Okay. So. okay, so thank you very much. And I hope Thanks. this gets something. Yeah. <laughs>